Hey, everybody. It's good to be together again this week to uh, study God's Word, prepare our hearts for worship. Thank you, Howard, for being with us. It's good to be here. And every week I say, oh, this is so interesting. <laughs> but, <laughs> and it is. But they, they really are, once again, the, the, the merging of Old Testament and New Testament and coming together in Paul's letter to the Romans. It's, it's just, I just love this. So I yeah. look forward to sharing it with with so you, Stephen, and whoever is online with us. Okay. Yeah, well, and in addition to our our good hour that we spend together studying the three main lessons of the day, I've put together a, a guide that can be downloaded from our website that has you know, tidbits, a memory verse, uh, the psalm, and some other, you know, a hymn each week that um, I, I did that with my family in mind. We homeschool our kids and teaching our children uh, prayers, the catechism, scripture is something that we want to weave into our, uh, our intentional structured time as a family, but also to connect it to worship is something that uh, yeah, is yeah. a blessing. So you can download uh, what I've put together and I'm gonna, I plan on doing that every week so that whether you're at your dinner table or bedtime prayers with your kids, uh, you can sing the sing the psalm, uh, or I mean, uh, say the psalm, or sing the hymn, or the, and usually there's a a portion of the small catechism that's uh, relevant to the theme of each worship service. And so uh, today, uh, this week, the portions of the catechism I went ahead and threw in the commandments one and two, and I think you'll see why as we go. Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get started with our study of the Old Testament lesson, epistle, and gospel lesson. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you give to us your very presence, your Holy Spirit that uses your word to work your will, uh, to show us our sins, to lift us up with your good news, and to uh, strengthen our faith and uh, prepare us to serve you. So, Lord, we pray that you would do that through, uh, through your power, uh, through your word, by your Holy Spirit today as we look to your scriptures. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the first lesson uh, is, without question, one of the most interesting and challenging books in all of the Holy Scriptures, uh, because where we are today uh, is, uh, uh, is in the book of Job. And again, there is no more book that is as challenging and could spend as much time discussing as this uh, this unusual book of Job, unusual for all kinds of reasons. Uh, and the one is that um, the book is written in uh, the Old Testament Hebrew, uh, but it is not from the Hebrew. It is borrowed from some other uh, oral tradition or some other writing uh, and has been taken uh, by our Heavenly Father and His Holy Spirit and given to the author who is not Job. Um, and the writer of the book of Job takes this oral tradition or whatever source he has been using because it's really outside the Israel tradition, if you would. And one of the indications is, and, and this is probably unnecessary, but at the same time, it's, it's interesting, at least to biblical scholars, it's interesting. And it is the, the primary Old Testament word, as you remember, from the Hebrew is the word, and again, how we pronounce it. But it might even be worth writing down once again, Y-A-H-W-E-H, -E and it is the name that God gave to Yahweh, that God gave to Moses from the text of the burning bush. And it became the name of God for God's Old Testament people as they are called out of, uh, yeah, Y-A-H-W-E-H. -E there we go. Uh, y A. Y A H W E H. <laughs> there we are. There we are. Yeah. There we are. And, and again, how we pronounce it is really a somewhat of an unknown because the ancient Hebrews and the Jews as well are extremely closed, closed lips and very, very, how would you say it? Very, very economic. They don't use that word often. They will use other words for it. But the name is Yahweh, and it is the word that is 
throughout the world, throughout history, and certainly throughout Old Testament and New Testament, the word that we translate, I am. Everything that exists, everything that ever was, everything that will ever be, everything and all creation is summed up in this one word for God, Yahweh, 25 times. However, it is never used in the conversations between Job and the three friends of his, I guess you could call them friends, who challenge his understanding of his illness, his understanding of his incredible loss, family, money, land, everything. He loses everything, as you may remember. And um, uh, and this word is never used by the three, the three persons primarily, um, who, who speak and challenge, uh, constantly challenge Job as to why he thinks he is, has lost everything and what they understand. As it turns out, they didn't understand anything. But that's another subject for another time. But anyway, the book of Job is a rewrite, if you will, in the Hebrew and was very early accepted in the Old Testament and the Old Testament canon. But again, it challenges, it challenges us, maybe especially at a time like this, Pastor Stephen, a time of COVID-19, where it seems that everything is going wrong, has gone wrong in the life of Job, and he becomes almost um, a, a... a living, breathing uh, example of or model of how one lives at a time where everything seems to be going wrong. Well, let me read this, okay, and then we'll come back to it once again. At at the end of the book, it's in the 38th chapter uh, of the book of Job. All the conversations have gone on before, and now at the end of this book, there is a young man by the name of Elihu who tries to summarize, maybe, uh, and put the best possible construction on all the wisdom or total lack of it in these friends who have been conversing with Job throughout these first 37 uh, 37 chapters. Elihu gives probably the closest and the deepest kind of understanding, but all of a sudden, all of that stops now in chapter 38. And what we hear from is not humanity. What we hear from is not the friends, not even Elihu, a young man with a lot of wisdom. And what we hear from is not even Job yet at this point. What we see here in this part of the book of Job, the end of the book, we hear God himself speaking. And so he speaks these words almost suddenly, almost suddenly. And the Lord said to Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have any understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon, uh, let's see, I can't see that last word there, on what, it, verse 6, on what its basis sunk or who laid its cornerstone. Verse 7, when the morning stars sang together and and, uh, all the sons of God shouted for joy. What God is doing at this point as he speaks to Job is putting the universe and Job's place in it in a kind of perspective. Job as you come with all your questions, as you come with all of your wisdom, as you come with all of those words laid on you by your friends, as you come with all of your losses, as you come with all of your needs, with your pains of body, mind, heart, and spirit, as you try to make sense out of this, Job, I want you to do this. Job, stand up like a man and speak to me. Stand up like a man, if you can, Job, at this point, and listen. And there's a kind of a a beautiful uh, expression, I think, that when God is speaking to us about our sins, we stand up and we take it like a man, if you will. We stand up, we confess, and we listen to his word. 
there is a time to fall flat on our face. I'm not sure it's when we are confronted with our sins, that's a time to stand up and listen, a time to face up. There is a time when I at least fall on my knees or fall flat on my face and I would commend it. And that's when I want to praise God. That's when I want to say thank you. That is when everything in my life stands before God. So what I'm confessing my sins, and this is what God is essentially saying to Job. When you confess your sins, stand up and take your sins, offer them to God and hear his word. His word will always be a word of judgment. I'll always be a word to stand up and take responsibility. But finally, it will always be a word in Jesus Christ. I forgive you. You are my daughter. You are my son. You are the one I love. I will never let you go. So that is behind, in a sense, it seems to me, what God is saying, what Yahweh is saying now to Job. Again, let's go back then to verse 8, because this is where the gospel lesson for the day is going to come in. Or who shut in the sea? Did you, Job? Did you, Elihu? Did you, Zophar? All the names of these persons who are speaking with Job. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds, its garment, and thick darkness, its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. And God is speaking these words about the oceans, uh, about the world that he created with his word and with his hand, and he said, Can you do this? Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Do you have any concept at all how all of this came to be, Job? Verse 12. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal, and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked, their light is withheld, and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed for you? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness, Job? Have you understood, have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this. Well, this is kind of uh, as, as uh, uh, the lections and the lessons for the day come to us, this is kind of just a taste, if you will, a uh, foretaste of what is going to come to us in the gospel. But if you are going to read the book of Job, and we read just this sliver for this Sunday, which should get the juices flowing that says, no, I didn't know any of this. I didn't do any of this. I may be an expert in the range of the universe or what is happening, but I can't answer one of these questions. Well, let's go to one more place in Job, and that's where I will stop. And that is, and the, it's Job, and you know already, what it is, Stephen, it's Job chapter 19, okay? Job chapter 19. And if you would go down in Job 19 to verse 21, you would hear and read these words of Job. 21, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, oh, you, my friends, for the hand of God has touched me. Why do you, like God, pursue me, my friends? Why are you not satisfied with my humanity, with my body, with my flesh? And now these words. As Job, it seems, lifted up his heart to God, or God lifts his words and places them, breathes them into the mouth of Job. Verse 23. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. 
Oh, that with an iron pen and lead, they were engraved in the rock forever and ever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. These are the places and the place from which we get, I know that my Redeemer lives. And this is what Job is saying in verse 25, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and whatever losses I experience in life, my Redeemer, which is exactly what a Redeemer does, a Redeemer stands between me and my losses. A Redeemer stands as the one who will purchase me out of everything that I have lost, everything that I have done to lose myself. The Redeemer is the one who will always hold me close because he is the one to whom I am related. And my Redeemer is my God. My Redeemer is my Heavenly Father. My Redeemer is my friend and comfort, the Holy Spirit. My Redeemer is the one who has life Whose resurrection I sing, I know that my Redeemer lives. That's, if you will, the center of the book, and it is that word out of the book of Job which comes again. And I want to make sure that we hear once again today, because as we read the book of Job, this needs to be the verse or verses which translate everything. The whole book of Job, another time, another time, Pastor yeah, Stephen. Yeah. But this is where we begin and where we end as this Sunday, as this Sunday, we hear the reading from the book of Job. Yeah. Well, wow. The God who created the winds and the waves and charted out their parameters. Uh, Job is counting on that same God to make his flesh behold his own eyes. Uh, what a what what a gruesome uh, phrase, right? After my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. My eyes shall behold not another. Uh, words of insight, prophecy of, of faith. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we'll pick it up once again when we get to the gospel for the day. Uh, just wait a second, because we got to go to the epistle for the day before we get to the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and again, uh, this morning, we're, or this afternoon, actually, for us uh, here, as, as we record this, um, uh, we're once again in the book of Romans. Remember St. Paul's letter to the Church of Romans? And I think now this is, what, the sixth or seventh, uh, reading uh, from the epistle in a row. So we've gone through uh, a good share of Romans. Um, and last week, we got into, in chapter 9, we got into St. Paul's great lament for his people and his, his strongest, strongest emotional and spiritual desire that they might come to know their Savior, who is Jesus Christ. And so he writes this to the church in Rome, both the Gentiles and now the Romans. And we're still, for the chapters 10, 11, and part of 12, 9, 10, and 11 especially, they are all written over against the background of his love for his fellow kinsmen, the Jews, and of his deepest passion and desire that in his mission and in his life in Christ and in his witness from Christ and to Christ and in his life that the, Rome, that the, the Jews to whom he's speaking would come to know what all the Old Testament has been saying all these centuries. And so now he's talking once again, both to and about his Jewish brothers and sisters, as well as the whole world around him. Verse 5 of chapter 10. 
Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring the word of God, Christ, down, or who will descend into the depths, into the abyss, that is to bring the word of God, Jesus Christ, up from the dead. But what does this word of God say? This is what it says. The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, a couple of weeks ago, when we were reading and the gospel lesson for the day was Matthew 13, we saw Jesus speaking to his disciples about the parables and why he uses parables. And he quotes from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. And what he says is, what he repeats is that he speaks these words in parables so that people may hear with their ears and see with their eyes and yet not understand, not grasp, not hold. Because Jesus goes on, it is not simply what you see with your eyes or hear with your ears. This was the problem with the God's Old Testament people and why Isaiah was called to speak to these people. He says that there is a place in our lives, a deep place in our lives, which is not simply what we see, nor simply what we hear and hold and understand, but there is a place in our lives, St. Paul says, or, or Jesus says, and it is the place in our heart. It is deeper than simply what we see or what we hear. For with the, yeah, there we are. Because verse 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your, there it is, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, verse 10, pay attention to this. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. And then with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. This 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 word of the heart, we could profitably spend a whole lot of time there, but if you remember, and if you put it down, and we might just put the words Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6. For there God speaks his, if you will, first commandment, uh, and it summarizes all of the Ten Commandments, and in a sense it summarizes all of the Old Testament law, which was meant to shape this new people coming out of slavery and give to them an identity, give to them a purpose, give to them a national identity, and so on. So here is what happened to it. Deuteronomy chapter 6, there is. And this is God's word. Again, if you will, a summary of the whole Old Testament law. Now, and Moses says this, now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God. And there is two concomitant words or two words which either are part of or breathe into or come out of that word, that you may fear. And the first is and this comes out of Luther's small catechism, that you may fear, love, and trust. And there is another word there, too, that fear implies, fear means to obey. Fear means, in this case, to love. Fear means to trust, okay? That you may fear, love, trust, and obey the word of the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son. Okay, now, <laughs> now we're back to, to verse 4, okay? 
Okay, this is the command. And it's the first command that is given to every devout Jew today, as well as 2,000 years ago or 1,500 years ago. Hear, O Israel, and the way it comes out, Shama Ha Israel, listen, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your, there it is, with all your heart, first of all, with all your soul, and with all your strength, with all your might, with all your body. So Moses addresses these words given him by God, the words of the covenant, the words of the commandment, and the introduction to this commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And you shall teach these words, verse 6. And these words that I command you today shall be on your, there we are again, on your heart. For the ancient Jews, as well as for the Jews at the time of our Lord, and the way that our Lord speaks to all the people, not simply the Jews, and that is your heart is the seat of your emotions held together and touching your soul. This is the place which faith comes out of, not simply out of your head, not simply out of your body and what you do, but it comes and sinks into your heart. And verse 7, then, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. Ever seen they're called the prayer phylacteries. And there is a little box. And inside that little box that is on your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. If you've ever seen a devout Jew uh, serving at the Western Wall, the Wall of Wailing, and the Wall of Prayer, you will see the prayer shawl, and then you will see these prayer phylacteries, both upon the hand, upon the arm bound, and also on the, looks like a little black pillbox, and inside both of these boxes are these words, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And if you get that one right, you pretty much live in this relationship with the God who has so loved you. Verse 8, once again, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and your gates. Okay, that's what St. Paul is talking about when he says the first and greatest commandment is in your heart. Now, if you would turn also, we don't need to do it right here. Well, maybe Mark chapter 12. Hey, can you get pick up that easily? Yeah. This is this is that marvelous story in Mark's gospel about the wise wise man. He's a, he's a lawyer and he comes to Jesus and um, let's go on down. Let's go on down a little bit further. Uh, past uh, a little bit further, a little bit further, a little bit further. There we go. The great commandments, the great command. Um, uh, and so in, in one of the gospels, it is the, the wise young man who comes and says, what must I do to be saved? In this case, in Mark's gospel, verse 28, it's one of the wise men, one of those um, scribes who are like the, the Hebrew or the Jewish lawyer, or who are the arbiters of the law. And so one of the scribes came up and heard the other scribes disputing with one another and seeing that Jesus, who, as they were talking back and forth, had answered them well, as you can picture their questions, and now their answers. And when Jesus answered them, they're just in an absolute quandary or panicky at this moment. And so the scribe comes up and asks Jesus, okay, now wait a minute, stop this second. Stop this second. I want to answer. I want to ask. And they all kind of look at, at each other and they look at the young, at the scribe. And now they turn to Jesus. And, he's, or, and, and, and the young man or the scribe asks, which commandment is the most important of all? Okay. Of all the commandments. And they've got six or 960 of them, all right? They cover every aspect of 900. Okay, now, now tell me, Jesus, 
which is the most important of all? And Jesus says, the most important is, listen to this, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And he's quoting all the way back from Deuteronomy chapter 6, and then he goes on. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Now, isn't it interesting that the Deuteronomy text you should, says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, Jesus says, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. It does not say that in the Old Testament. Who is this Jesus that he can add to the Old Testament and put in there with all your mind? Well, he's a son of God. And there is in all these ensuing centuries, Jesus takes this word and recognize whether it's the ancient Greeks or whether it is uh, the rationalists of his day. He said, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And that's one that we just pack away. Because if you would do a summary, if you will, of the law as Jesus gives it, this is the law. Love your Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and your neighbor is yourself. Now, you know that neighbor is yourself comes from Leviticus. It is not part of the original commandment, but Jesus takes all of it. And the scribe then says to him, verse 32, you are right, teacher. Well, that ought to come as a real affirmation to Jesus, who is nothing less than the wisdom of God in the flesh. You are right, teacher. You have truly said that. He is one, there's no other to him. And to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, to love your neighbor as yourself, as is much more than all. Well, what's Jesus' answer? Verse 34. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Well, that is, again, the summary, if you will, of the Old Testament that St. Paul is speaking of. And we can go back to the, to the lesson for the day, uh, because all this is, is background to what St. Paul is saying as he talks about, um, in the gospel lesson, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses Jesus Christ and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is now today and this is so important to that Roman church, or I'm, I'm sorry, to that, yeah, the Roman church, church is in Rome. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Promise. Wait a minute now. Verse 14, St. Paul says, but how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear unless somebody brings the word of God to them? I would have used another translation other than preaching simply because preaching always gets associated with the preacher and the preacher always gets associated with the pulpit. So everybody has to come to church in order to get preached. to. No, how are they to hear without somebody telling them, without somebody announcing, without whatever word you would use? But it's much deeper and much more common and much more all of our responsibilities. How are they to hear with somebody letting them know? How are they to hear without somebody preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? as it is written in the Old Testament, the Psalm, one of the most beautiful verses from all of the Psalms. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. The Psalm is from Isaiah, incidentally, not from the Psalms. Verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith 
comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. This is now word from St. Paul to the church in Rome and now especially to this, this growing church which is both Gentile, all the nations, and Jews who are those special people God has chosen to be these proclaimers and to bring the word all over. Yeah, um, we could say a whole lot more, but probably get to the God. There we are. There we are. There we are. All right. Back to the gospel. Yeah. The gospel. Hearing through the we word. We all stand for the gospel for, for Sunday. And uh, Jesus comes and he speaks this word to us. I do want to say before we move away, you know, when we had to shut shut the doors of the church in March uh, as the precaution, as everyone's learning about the pandemic and how to how to be safe and how to reduce risk, uh, we were able to do so with great confidence that the word of God, the hearing of the word of God, is power, and uh, and so to, to be able to use the internet to continue to to share the word of God. And also to be able to put books and resources, devotionals in people's hands where, where parents can read to their children and uh, those who are uh, solitary in their homes you know, are able to, to dig in themselves to Holy Scripture. We, we know that we're not alone and we're not without God's action when we have, uh, have His Word. Uh, I, I also think it's just important in times of crisis that we have God's word memorized, that it would be uh, in our ears and on our minds so that if we don't have access to the internet, if we don't have access to the Bible pages themselves or devotion books, uh, we would still uh, be able to uh, meditate on the word of God, but also share the word of God. So, you know, if you're finding yourself having more time on your hands during this shutdown, because Travel is not allowed, and uh, you're, you're home with less to do. Work on memorizing. Let that word of God uh, fuel your faith, but also uh, be ready to share with others. Yeah, there, there is probably a number of stories like this, Stephen, but the one that I know happened uh, to Lutheran pastors and is their story following the breakup of the Soviet Union and the openness of what was left of Russia at that point and its satellites. Um, there were Lutheran pastors who went to Kazakhstan because they knew that there were uh, small groups of Lutherans in that uh, nation of Kazakhstan, many of whom, <coughs> excuse me, had escaped from, of all places, Siberia, that place of, of death. They'd come to Kazakhstan, and they found these little Lutheran settlements in Kazakhstan. And so one by one, as they, as they were told where they were, and they, that, that uh, they went to these little Lutheran settlements. And what they found in more than one is that these Lutheran Christians who had for now 50, 60 years lived in Siberia as they were sentenced to there along with their pastors who were quick either imprisoned or died. And they came to this, these, these two Lutheran pastors came to this one particular uh, little Lutheran settlement in Kazakhstan and asked them if they had a Bible, <laughs> which they did not. The Bibles were confiscated. The Bibles were taken. But what these Lutherans did do is went into the cracks in the little houses they were living in or huts they were living in or went and uh, found under their mattresses little odds and ends that they had put together of the Holy Scriptures. And so they were able to assemble, handwritten, they were able to assemble Bibles of a sort, which were drawn from the memories of these Christians, and that were their Holy Scriptures, that which they had memorized. Now, God willing, that will never become a necessity in our lives, 
But what is necessary, it seems to me, is to, and when you speak of memorizing, uh, uh, again, one of the great blessings I had to do, and you have to do, <laughs> that's a great blessing, even though it may not seem like it at the time, is that the, the memories take this word of God and in mind, yeah, in body, yes, but finally they are put into the heart. Yeah. And it's from the heart, as St. Paul, uh, we've just read in his writings, and from Moses speaking to God's Old Testament people, with all your heart, with all your heart. So memorization may filter through the mind, but it is held in the heart, sacred and the soul forever. Thanks, Stephen, and thanks for what you're doing there. Well, and, and when I when I remind people of that, it's I don't want to give the impression that I'm good at memorizing, that it's easy. It's it's <laughs> it's been the bane of my existence to memorize anything. Um, but I found, you know, if you take a one verse and you repeat it for an hour and a half, <laughs> write it down. Uh, it, it kind of works its way in and um, it seems like a long time to spend on a single verse. But I tell you, God has blessed me with, with one verse at a time. And yeah. um, uh, so I just want to encourage people toward that. Right. And, and it happens, has happened so often in my life. <laughs> the word of God, but all of a sudden the passage is there, and I say, "Where in the world did that come from?" I didn't even know I knew that. Yeah, and maybe yeah. I did. Maybe it was just the whole world of the Holy Spirit who takes His Word and breathes it into us in ways that we don't even know. And I am not talking about something which is uh, extraordinary or superhuman. Just <laughs> talking about the way the Holy Spirit gives himself to us in our lives so you're exactly memorize it and pack it away because it's going to be there that's going to be there and force your kids to memorize it although little kids they love they love memorizing things yep the holy gospel if you remember and we set this up from the last two sundays remember um, um two sundays ago the disciples were coming back to Jesus after they had uh, made their first missionary journey out there. Um, and during this period of time, Jesus found out that John the Baptist had been executed by Herod. And so immediately following this, he takes his disciples and he goes off into the wilderness for a for a retreat, for a time of, of kind of thinking through, for a time of processing what it means that this greatest of Old Testament prophets, John the Baptist, has now been killed, and all of this word and all of this responsibility both falls upon them at this point, as it had in the life of Jesus from eternity. But at the same time, there is a, there is a, new, a, a new moment in this kingdom of God that is coming and is presently. Um, and so they, 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 they go to this wilderness place, and you remember last week then, that this is where Jesus gives the loaves and the fishes, fishes and this sign of the kingdom, the sign of manna of the Old Testament, the sign of the kingdom. And this may or may not be wasted on these people. They may be thinking 5,000 or 10,000 of them with women and children. They may be thinking no further than their stomachs. Uh, and they may be thinking no further than wondering where this came from. But this is a kingdom moment. This is a kingdom sign. And when Jesus speaks about the coming of kingdom, he is not speaking simply about, ab about words. He also gives them the kingdom signs, whether it's in the healing, whether it's in the feeding of the 5,000 or the 10,000, or in this moment that we're about to read this morning. It is a high, high kingdom moment. You ready? Stand up then, verse 22. So immediately, and this is immediately following the feeding of this 5,000, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he 
dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Finally, it seems that Jesus is going to get a moment to himself, yeah. not being surrounded and demanded and uh, pressed by the crowds. Uh, after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. This is not an unusual experience, and we see this both in Mark's gospel and in Matthew's gospel particularly. They point how Jesus would get up early in the morning or how he would go by himself apart to pray. And evening was coming. So when evening came after the work of the day and the feeding of the 5,000 and the disciples, he sent off to the other side of the sea of the Sea of Galilee. When evening came, Jesus was there alone. Verse 24. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land and beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And this was not an unusual experience in the Sea of Galilee. Sea of Galilee, it's not a huge, huge sea, but, but, but it's, it's more, you know, we would call it a lake today. Um, but there are east winds which, are, which come in. I say east winds, no, west winds that come in. And they whip up this shallow, relatively shallow uh, Sea of Galilee, or Lake of Tiberias, as it's sometimes called, and whips it into a frenzy so that you've got this little boat and you've got a lot of water and the winds come down and they whip this up very quickly. It can be kind of quiet and just a nice place to sail on, but suddenly these winds come along. And so this is what happens, verse 24. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, and now it was being beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And now in the fourth watch of the night, I'm not sure why we didn't just translate that, but the watch, fourth watch of the night, the night is, or the, the day is divided up into, into watches. And this is the watch between three o'clock in the morning and six o'clock in the morning, as I understand it. That is the fourth watch, as I understand it. You might check me out on that, but that's what my memory tells me. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. Verse 26. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. They are terrified because there is some sort of an apparition, and if they don't have enough trouble with the water trying to sink their boat, all of a sudden they've got also this specter, this ghost coming. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart. Relax. Don't worry. It is I. So do not be afraid. Now, now what exactly is going on here? Uh, what, what I want to tell you, this is about the kingdom, okay? It's not about walking on water. This is about the kingdom. It's not simply about a... A storm on the sea and Jesus walking on the water. This is a kingdom moment, a kingdom sign. Take heart. It is I, Jesus says. Don't be afraid. And Peter, yeah, who else but Peter? And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, then command me to come to you on the water. And so Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, and when obviously he was whipped by the waves at the same time, he was suddenly filled with fear and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And there is so much packed into those words for you and for me today. As we try probably not to walk on the water, but as we have to in these days in front of us, sometimes I think, live with so little or live with so little of what our coming financial support is going to be or how we're going to make through through this and where we are terrorized by the by the idea that the 
COVID-19 is also the world around us and one in which we wonder whether or not we can survive, whether we cry out, oh yeah, there's the picture. There is the picture, one of the most beautiful of stained glass windows I have ever seen, and it is right within our own Zion Lutheran Church. And it's the wind is I re, or the window as I remember is dedicated to Anne Louise Popo, not to our Anne Louise who has gone to heaven about three four years ago, but to her, uh, I believe it's her aunt. Uh, anyway, it, it is one of the great windows set in uh, Zion Lutheran Church, which gives so much life and love as we watch the evening or the morning sun come in through these stained glass windows. Lord, help me, help me. And the word is come, come, come to me. So in this, in this kingdom moment, we're all the way back, remember the Old Testament, where you have Job and the three friends of his or friends' enemies and you also have this new young man, Elihu, appearing on. And in this transition, God suddenly speaks in the midst of this conversation that have been going on between, between Job and those who are trying to either cheer him up or explain to him what's happening. And when I think explaining to him, I'm going to tell this side story because it's come to me again this week. And that is... In my life as a pastor in uh, Conover, North Carolina, probably the lowest moment of all is that was that one of my dear friends, he was a Baptist who uh, uh, ran the local drugstore and he was also a mayor and he and I become, became so close and he asked if he could commune with us because he was a Baptist but he would come with his family, his wife and three children. And, and, uh, 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 and he asked, I would love to be able to commune with him because he would come to the table. He went to his Baptist church after services, early services there. But then he would, uh, he would kneel at the table and I would commune. His wife and his two sons were, who were communing at that point. Anyway, long, long story short, he asked if he could commune. And I took it to the elders and the elders said, we would love to have him commune with us. And so I will never forget that first Sunday when he uh, communed with us at the table. There wasn't a dry eye in that large congregation, I think, because everybody knew their mayor, everybody loved their mayor and respected him. And now he knelt with his family and he communed with, with us. It was about, uh, about six months later that suddenly, suddenly this beautiful man died and, and uh, uh, his family was, was bereft at this point. It was about now six weeks later that we baptized his daughter, Tammy. And about six weeks after that, she was hit by our school bus and she died. So we had Hilda and the two boys all of a sudden, all of a sudden, and the whole congregation, this whole small town of about 3,500 people was just driven, driven to despair and sadness. And one of the members of the Baptist church at that point that he had gone to came and asked one of our members if the school bus driver had been speeding. Okay. And the school bus driver had not been speeding at all when she uh, ran over this, this darling little daughter uh, in the faith of ours. And our member said, no, she had not been speeding. She was just starting her vehicle after dropping somebody off. And the response of this lady who asked the question was, well, if she was not speaking, then it must be the will of God. Mm. Okay. And all of a sudden, we're all the way back into Job, as if we can explain the mind of God, or if we can understand the mind of God, or if somehow or other, this loss and this sudden death was, was the will of God. We have no idea. The only thing we know for sure, 
for sure is that when we cry out in our drowning, when we cry out to our Lord in our fear, when we cry out to our Lord in the midst of our losses, there will always, thank you, thank you, thank you for the picture. There will always be the sound of our Lord's voice the voice of our Heavenly Father and the voice of the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, and that voice will say, come to me and let me hold on to you until you are safe. So this, this kingdom moment, you know, if, if, if these 12 disciples, they were all in the boat at that time, if these 12 disciples had heard the word of, Job, of God in Job saying, where were you? When I created everything, if they had heard the full blast of the voice of God coming from our Lord Jesus Christ, they would have turned into cinders on the spot. But what they have is a quiet kind of kingdom moment, if you will, a moment that even though they're terrified because the boat is going down, it may go down, and they see this apparition on the sea, what they are experiencing there, I believe, Pastor Stephen, is a kingdom moment, something that they can hang on to, something that they can hold on to, something that will not terrify them with the sound of God saying, where were you when I created the seas? And they would have been absolutely drowned in that voice in that moment with the almighty God speaking of them. But what they have is almost a quiet kind of kingdom moment. A kingdom moment not simply for Peter, but a kingdom moment for all of them. As Jesus immediately reached out his hand, verse 31, and took hold of him saying, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Truly you are the Messiah. For the signs of the kingdom are all there, whether it's signs in the healing of the deaf, dumb, blind, and lame, whether that kingdom is in the voice of God as he teaches us, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind, or whether it's in this moment where there is not a kingdom moment so much in the healing or in the words or is in the life of the Son of God who simply walks on the water and announces to them in no uncertain terms, I've got the whole world in my hand. I have the whole universe in my hand. And whether that healing or whether that saving happens immediately or happens over a lifetime, what we are hearing here and what we know, what we know is that we never slip out of the hand of God. And he says to us in this moment as we listen to this lesson, what he says to us in the moment as he bids us come to the table to receive his body and blood, whether we, we, we hear this moment in the fact that he has said to us in our baptism, come, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is kingdom moment. And when Jesus speaks and we read his word right here, right now, whether it's, whether it's live streaming, Pastor Stephen, or whether it's with that small gathering, or whether it's in the, those moments that shall be in front of us when we will sing at the top of our, 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 top of our lungs. Uh, come to the kingdom. Come to the kingdom. Come to Zion. Truly you are the Son of God. Thoughts? Yeah, you know, when, when Peter makes this request of Jesus, you know, it seems to be Peter's character to be so bold. But And Peter agrees and he walks out. But the question itself, just, you know, my mind goes to Satan in the wilderness testing Jesus, you know, just challenging Jesus to display uh, miracles of sorts and um, to, to rely on the power of God for human survival. And, but... But Peter gets out and he walks. And um, so it seems to me like this isn't a, a challenge 
uh, to Jesus. It's a, it's a request of Jesus that's rooted in, in true faith. And Peter jumps out and he walks and Jesus keeps him above the water. And, and so then when he begins to sink, well, the, you know, Jesus calls to, points out the faith issue and the doubt issue. But, the, but Jesus grabs hold. You know, Peter's sinking and he's, uh, Jesus reaches down and, and holds him up. But what is interesting thing that it's not until the two of them walk back across the water or maybe Jesus is carrying Peter across the, in his arms. It, it doesn't tell us that detail. But it's when they get back into the boat that the wind dies down and the, the water becomes calm. So you don't see it described and so we don't see depicted you know that journey across the the windy <laughs> surface of the water back to the boat but i think a lot of us are are in that that we are we've called out to jesus jesus has grabbed hold of our lives and we're we're heading forward and um, the wind is still blowing and we we have a lot of reasons to be afraid, but, but Christ has us in his arms. So, you know, praise God that he, uh, he does save us and he is near enough to reach down and grab hold of us. Well, there is such a, an, an, a world, a universe of difference between the Old Testament lesson where God speaks about the universe, about the universes, about the sun, the moon, the stars, everything else that surrounds our little corner of the universe, but such an ex extraordinary, extraordinary, unbelievable distance between what God says to Job and what he says to us in our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. But both of those are moments when God speaks and the kingdom is coming. The kingdom has come. And now, once again, it seems to me for us today in this time that seems to be so unkingdom like and so unking like that God says to us again quietly, quietly in his son Jesus, come. Yeah. Come. Yeah. Well, we want the Lord to hold on to us. And that, so this is the window that's dedicated to the Oh to well, that's the, the uh, it's very similar. That's, yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. To memory of Louise Pofal. And it's, uh, of course, not Jesus clinging to the cross. It's us, the church, the, the woman holding on to the cross in the storms. But, and she's on the rock, which is Christ. And that's, of course, the, the psalm gives, for this week gives reference to that rock. I want to put up on the screen here at the end uh, what I was talking about, what I've put together that can be downloaded from our website. And my plan is to do this for every single Sunday where uh, from the service I picked out something short that would be a memory verse. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Psalm 18.2. And I don't have the video here, but my little two-year-old was saying that yesterday around the, the dinner table. And I thought, wow, what a sweet thing. But uh, just some, some um, material that you can use in your family devotional time or your individual oh, like, devotional time. Like, yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Fear, love, and trust in God above all things, the meaning of the first commandment. You know, call upon, you know, using the name of the Lord properly, call upon it in every trouble. Pray, praise, and give thanks. And then uh, there's a few other items. And I just, I love this hymn. It's going to be in our Sunday worship service. Uh, telling our soul to be calm. You know, it, it's all, it's in turmoil for so many reasons. But be still, my soul, the Lord is on your side. The, toward the end of verse 2. Yeah, yeah. Be still, Thank my you. soul, the waves and winds still know his voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. And that's referring to this, Jesus' command on a couple of occasions, to be calm, to calm the wind and the waves. And so we're asking Jesus to calm our soul as we experience the turbulence. So yeah, you can find that on our website. And there's prayers, there's materials, and um, short nuggets that can be memorized, but just 
you know, use it throughout the week. And those last two lines I thought of all this week, um, and or all this week, we're only on Tuesday, but as I was thinking through these lessons for the Old Testament and the Gospel lesson today, they are, for my money, two of the most beautiful lines in all of Christian hymnody. Be still, my soul, the wind and waves still know him who ruled them while he lived below. That's yeah. all yeah. my that's great <laughs> thank, thank you, Stephen. Yeah. Thank well, you. thank you. Uh, look forward to this every week. And uh, uh, before our next Bible study, of course, we'll have our worship service itself. So, uh, funeral service on Friday, Karma Smith, and please pray for all of them. Turbulent times yeah. for our spirits and our emotions. Um, praise be to God that we have our Savior, Jesus. Thank you. Lord be with you, Stephen. Take care, y'all.